and we only made it to 20. So <laughs> we're going to pick it up in chapter 21 tonight. Chapter 19 was just, I didn't want to, and I'm so glad we didn't uh, rush through it so much there uh, in that chapter. And we see really a turning point uh, now, especially on the part of Job. Uh, we'll see his response, uh, a bit of a different tone after in chapter 19, he declares that he knows that his Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And um, after that, after chapter 19, uh, we saw a noticeable change in uh, Job's response to these three so-called friends. So we're going to see it again uh, tonight as well. So we'll pick it up in chapter 21. Why don't we pray first and we'll ask God to bless our time together in this word. <coughs> Pardon me. Loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for your word and this time together that we have tonight in your word. Lord, we desire nothing more than <clears throat> to have you speak into our lives in and through your word, and especially in and through these chapters that we have here before us tonight in the book of Job. Lord, thank you for including the book of Job in scripture for us all of these generations later. Some of the things we're going to see here tonight have powerful and even profound application to our lives today. And we're so grateful to you that we can learn the lessons from your word and from Job and even from his so-called friends. So Lord, thank you in advance for what you're going to do in our time together tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Chapter 21, uh, beginning in verse 1. Job is now responding to Bildad, who just railed on him, laid into him, continuing to rebuke him, falsely accuse him, and even call him names, uh, such as a hypocrite. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, one of many. And so this is where we really see this change in Job in how he answers and responds. Verse 1 says, Then Job answered and said, Listen carefully to my speech, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak. Now this is interesting because prior, he was getting very blunt, and, and you can't blame him, rightfully so, in his attempt to defend himself against these ludicrous and absurd false accusations. So he's very graciously, I don't know if by chapter 21 I would be so gracious, but Job is graciously saying, to them, in effect, to build that particularly, um, just to hear me out. <laughs> Bear with me. And then he says this, and it's, it's a sanctified, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a sanctified shaming because he says, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. In other words, I know that after I'm done speaking, you're just going to keep mocking me and ridiculing me, and falsely accusing me, but I'm going to say it anyway. And so he continues, verse 4, As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me, and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Again, picture the scene. Job is sitting on an ash heap in this rubbish heap as he's, you'll forgive the, the graphic description, but I think it's needed. 
in order to fully embrace and grasp what's really happening here, the intensity and the enormity of Job's plight. He is with sharp objects scraping the boils that cover him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And I imagine that they could not even look at him. And if they did, they, they would have to just wince with horror at the sight of this man that is their friend. And it's, it's like he's saying, just take a look at me. And I know it's astonishing. And put your hand over your mouth. I think this is in a twofold sense. First, it's kind of a gasp at the horror and the hideousness of Job's condition. But I think it's secondly also inferring that put your hand over your mouth and close your mouth. Do not speak anymore. Do not speak anymore. Verse 6, even when I remember I am terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Can you even imagine what it must have been like? I mean, I think about, forget the physical. How about the emotional and the psychological trauma and, and, and turmoil when he says, and, and trembling takes hold of my flesh, I imagine this to be literal. That he is convulsing and, and shaking and literally, physically trembling. Verse 7, why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants, verse 8, are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing, verse 12, to the tambourine and harp, and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? In other words, Job is, is just... I, I, for lack of a better word, he is flabbergasted at how it is that the wicked, and we're going to be talking about this in more detail here shortly, but he's just flabbergasted at how it is that the wicked seem to prosper and live long and full lives without adversity. And, and look at him. Contrary to what his so-called friends have accused him of, namely that of being wicked himself, that of having sin in his life, which he needs to repent of, so that God could bring this horror to an end. And he, he, he says, think about this. You're, you're accusing me of being wicked? Have you looked around? To see how it is that just because you're wicked doesn't mean that you're going to be covered from head to toe with boils? How about, how do you explain this, in other words? How, how do you explain the wicked prospering and, and living long, full life, and they want nothing to do with God? They blaspheme God. Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit do we have if we pray to Him? We have no desire for the knowledge of His ways. We don't, we don't want nothing to do with God. Let, yet look at their, their lives. Job is trying to reason with the unreasonable. He's trying to reason with them. I mean, just it, it, logically speaking. 
Forget theologically, just logically speaking. Because their theology is all whacked and they're about to have a, <laughs> a change in their theology when God finally breaks into this scene, which I can't wait, and sets them straight. Job 2. God has a few words for Job as well. And for those of you who read ahead to stay ahead, you know <laughs> that uh, Job uh, is not innocent uh, when it comes to some of the things that he uttered from his lips. He says, verse 16, Indeed their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? The sorrows God distributes in his anger. They are like straw before the wind and like chaff that a storm carries away. They say, God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him that he may know it. Let his eyes see his destruction and let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what does he care about his household after him when the number of his months is cut in half? Can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those on high? One dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and secure. His pails are full of milk, and the marrow of his bones is moist. Another man, verse 25, dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. They lie down alike in the dust, and worms cover them. Look, I know your thoughts and the schemes with which you would wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince, and where is the tent? the dwelling place of the wicked. Have you, verse 29, not asked those who travel the road? And do you not know their signs? For the wicked are reserved for the day of doom. That's key. Hang on to that. We're going to come back to that shortly. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Who condemns his way to his face? And who repays him for what he has done? Yet he shall be brought to the grave and a vigil kept over the tomb. The clods of the valley, verse 33, shall be sweet to him. Everyone shall follow him as countless have gone before him. How then can you comfort me with empty words since falsehood remains in your answers? Wow. Well, we're going to talk about that too uh, here, I think, about the end of chapter 22 or 23. But um, they're not trying to comfort him. Do, do you get the impression that they're trying to comfort him? I, I think, you know, Job, in all fairness, to our, our dear friend Job here, for whom we have such pity and grief, considering that which he is experiencing, but these, that's why I'm calling them so-called friends. You'll forgive me for doing so, but I don't, I don't think they have any intention. I don't think from the very beginning, even the seven days of silence, I don't think from the get-go that they were ever interested in comforting him. And again, we'll talk about the, that later. So chapter 21 Job is refuting them by arguing to the contrary because he is, in effect, uh, refuting and contradicting everything they have said to him prior. I mean, keep in mind, they've, they've accused him of being wicked, being evil, and we're going to see it here in a moment as well. They've accused him of everything falsely. They falsely accused him of everything, and he comes back. And this is important because long before we even get to this point, certainly, and think about this, if Job did have some secret sin in his life, don't you think that by now he would have repented, if for no other reason, just to get some relief? I mean, he even said as much. Are you guys kidding me? 
I mean, it's a loose paraphrase of the, <laughs> of the text, but it's almost as if he's saying, are you kidding me? You're accusing me of having this secret sin, which is why God is judging me and punishing me and doing this to me. The implication being, if I would repent, this would end. Are you kidding me? I, I would have repented on day one. I wouldn't have even let one day go by. I would have been repenting. It, listen, about the time, <laughs> I mean, 10 of my children are dead. Um, everything, all of my wealth is gone. My wife can't bear to see me like this and wants me to just curse God so that God will put me out of my misery and get this over with. It's that bad. It's, and and if, if Job had secret sin, you're telling me that he wouldn't have repented by now? I, I would have repented pre-boils, I assure you, <laughs> long before Satan was given permission to afflict me physically. I would have repented a long time ago. And that's basically the case that he is arguing. And he couches it in terms of those who are wicked yet prosper. And he compares, even contrasts, the wicked to the righteous and how that both prosper. So what gives? I mean, in other words, and keep in mind, their theology is this. If you're good, then God will be good to you. If you're bad, then God will do bad to you. That's their theology. So now their, their gears are jammed because... If Job is good and this is bad, that doesn't, that doesn't re reconcile. That doesn't fit. That really jams my gears. And I, I think God is wanting to jam their gears. <laughs> and, and God's going to jam Job's gears a little bit too. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And simply put, all of Job's so-called friends are wrong in their assessment and even more wrong in their unwillingness to abandon their falsehoods. And this is why Job says what he says about their falsehoods. And, and again, in a sanctified sarcasm, maybe that's a better word, a sanctified sarcasm, he says, you know what, I'm going to say this, but it's not going to make any difference. You're going to continue to mock me. You're going to continue to accuse me. You're going to continue all of your falsehoods, no matter what I say. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, no matter what you said, it made no difference? It, it, as genuine and as sincere and even as humble as you try to be and gracious in the way that you communicate it, Sometimes nothing you can say will make any difference. There's an obstinance. There's an arrogance. There's a, a stubbornness. There's really a pride on the part of some that they will never, because of how they are and even who they are, they will never receive a rebuke. You can, you can try to talk sense. You can try to reason with them. You can just try to, to be logical <laughs> with them. And they'll never receive it. We had an acronym uh, on the mainland in uh, the ministry, and uh, we called it FAT. We wanted fat people. <laughs> which you can see why, you know, <laughs> I was uh, accepted. No, FAT is the acronym. Faithful, available, and teachable. Teachable. People had to be teachable. They had to be able to receive instruction. You had to be able to speak into their lives. And they had to be teachable. Otherwise, they were not usable. 
I have no interest. I I'm getting, well, I'm getting off, off track here, off message. I digress, as they say. But I'm, <laughs> I'm at the place in my life where, and I'm speaking of myself, okay, where <sighs> I can't afford not to be teachable myself. <laughs> Listen, I've lived too much of my Christian life not being teachable, and I have the scars to prove it. And I just say that very honestly. I'm being very transparent. I remember young, as a young man, young in, in the faith and really immature in the Lord. And I was just, and I know you know nothing of this, <laughs> but I was so obstinate, so stuck. I thought I knew it all. You couldn't tell me anything. I had a, a brother a, um, that had a spiritual spine confront me and say to me, you know, nobody can tell you anything. You're always right. And I thought, wow. And the Lord used that. You know, the wounds of a friend are faithful, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And he was telling me, as a friend, being faithful to me because of his love for me. If he, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have bothered. He said, yeah, go on. <laughs> See ya. Wouldn't want to be ya. I know where that leads. I've been there, done that. And he cared enough to say, listen, um, you're not teachable. You are so full of yourself. Nobody can tell you anything. And I'll tell you, the, the Lord got to be, and I needed to hear that, and I needed to heed that. And I started thinking about conversations in the past that I've had, dialogues, uh, concerning really uh, areas of ministry. And I wasn't in the pastorate at the time, so <laughs> don't look at me like you were just looking at me. This is long before I got into the, the ministry, okay? And it was on the mainland, remember. It was in a land far, far away and a long, long time ago. And I started thinking back about all of those times where I just dug my heels in, in my obstinance, my, my stiff-necked stubbornness, and boy, did I pay the price. Boy, did I pay the price. There's something about being on the receiving end of somebody who cares enough to speak the truth into your life as much as it hurts. It's the honest truth, and sometimes that truth hurts, but it's a good thing. And I tell you, before the Lord, it was a real turning point in my life. I began to humble myself, and I started listening. I was uh, watching an uh, interesting uh, documentary about the power of just listening and not talking, which for me, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's an issue. Um, to listen more and talk less. You know, one said that God gave us two ears and one mouth. Do the math. To listen twice as much as we, as we speak. And to not talk over people. Let them talk and let them speak into your life. Y you never know. God may have a word for you through somebody, like Oswald Chambers says, we, we, we are okay when the Lord breaks us, but sometimes we're not okay with who the Lord chooses to use as the instrument to break us. <laughs> sometimes God will have somebody, the last person you would ever want God to use, to have that word to speak into your life. You know, the Proverbs talk about how rod sharpens rod, and iron sharpens iron, and so too does the does one man sharpen the countenance of another. Well, you know, when you do that, when you rub the two knives together, it creates friction and heat, but it sharpens, it sharpens. Well, chapter 22, verse 1, then Eliphaz, the Temanite, answered and said, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's a, 
I have to laugh because if I don't laugh, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry for Job. <laughs> Verse 2, can a man be profitable to God? Though he who is wise may be profitable to himself. <laughs> is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity without end? Are you kidding me? They're, they're still insinuating that Job is wicked and his iniquity is without end. He has just got done pleading with them to be reasonable. And he's defending himself and his innocence. And this Eliphaz has the audacity to continue this accusation that Job is wicked. Verse 6, it gets worse. Hang on. For you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason. You rip people off. It gets worse. Hang on. And strip the naked of their clothing. Oh. <laughs> Eliphaz is, is saying of Job that you've robbed the poor blind. You've taken their last bit of clothing off their backs and left them shamefully naked. It gets worse. Verse 7, you have not given weary, the weary water to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. In other words, Job was very wealthy, remember? And he never used any of that wealth to give people water to drink who were thirsty and bread to eat who were hungry. <laughs> Verse 8, but the mighty man possessed the land, and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty. Wow! What does James say about pure, undefiled religion? It's the fatherless and the widows, and those who are in prison. And by the way, prison then, uh, there were no meals, there were no gyms. Just saying. If you were sent to prison in that day, you were sent to die. And it was a dungeon, and they didn't feed you. The only way you would eat is if friends brought you food to eat and water to drink. That's what James says is pure, undefiled religion. That's true Christianity. That's true love. It's the, wit the helpless, those who can't help themselves. Those widows, those fatherless, those in prison. And here is Eliphaz. Really? He is <laughs> saying of Job. Not only, look, look at the, the, uh, the, the implication here in verse 9 is that widows came to him, to Job. As often was the case, they would go to those who were wealthy and ask for help. And Job was certainly very, very wealthy. So he's saying, the widows that came to you and asked for help from you, you sent them away empty-handed. And here it is, and the strength of the fatherless was crushed. You crushed them. Therefore, verse 10, man, I could just hear the tone of this guy's voice. Snares are all around you, and sudden fear troubles you, <laughs> or darkness so that you cannot see, and an abundance of water covers you. That's why. Connect the dots, Job. You, you sent the, the widows away, you crush the fatherless. This is why this is all happening to you. Verse 12, is not God, I'm sure he said it with reverb. <laughs> is not God in the height of heaven and see the highest stars, how lofty they are. And you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? 
Thick clouds cover him so that he cannot see. And he walks above the circle of heaven. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod? Translated. <laughs> Job, you're going to continue in your wickedness, aren't you? You're not going to repent, are you? Verse 16, the wicked men have trod who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood. They said to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things. But the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh at them. Surely, verse 20, our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes their remnant. Now, acquaint yourself with him. <laughs> what? <laughs> you need to get reacquainted with God, because obviously, Job, you're so wicked and far away from God. You need to return to the Lord. You need to repent and come back to God. <laughs> you're, you're, you're evil. You're, you're wicked. You've done evil. You've done wicked. Acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby, and here it is, listen very carefully, good will come to you. That's their theology. Job, you've been a very, very, very bad boy. And that's why things are very, very, very bad for you. You want things to be good again? <laughs> you want good to come to you? We need to come back to God. Because obviously, that's the problem here. Can't you see it? Verse 22, receive, please, instruction from his mouth. Wait. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, God has been silent heretofore. He can't, oh, were God to... And you got to wonder, if God were to say prematurely, Job, hang in there, he'll ruin everything. It'll defeat the whole purpose of all of this. He can't. He has to remain silent. Because he has, I hate to use this word, you'll forgive me, he has a bet of sorts with Satan. The bet is that if God allows Satan to do what Satan has done to Job, surely, without question, Job will curse him to his face. The accusation from the accuser of the brethren, the devil himself, is, of course, God, Job is going to worship you. Look at how you blessed him. Well, no wonder. The only reason Job worships you is because of how you've blessed him and, and prospered him. You, you let me take away all of his prosperity. He'll curse you. So God says, okay, deal. So Satan goes, takes away all of his prosperity, and Job doesn't curse him. And then Satan has to regroup, come back. He does. Okay. Well, you, you let me afflict him. You let me take his children. He'll curse you. Take the children. Does not curse God. Okay. Let me afflict him. He afflicts him. And interesting, we talked about this last week. He does not afflict Job anywhere close in proximity to his mouth. He keeps that intact. When Job refers to the only thing he's and this is where we get that, that saying, he escaped by the skin of his teeth. He said, the only thing that, I, that has escaped this horrific plot and plight of mine is the skin of my teeth. Well, you know why Satan didn't afflict this? He certainly had permission to, right? Remember? God said you can do anything you want to him. You can't kill him. You can do anything you want to him. So what does Satan do? He does everything except touch the mouth. He's got to keep that intact. Why? Because he wants him to curse God. If he doesn't keep the mouth 
and the skin of his teeth intact, he cannot speak at all, let alone curse God. So, so he does all of this, and yet Job, and as we know, in the end, in all of this, Job did not curse God. But here's what Job did with the mouth and the ability to speak being left intact, did. He cried out to God, pleaded with God, God, what have I done? Show me. Whatever it is, I will receive whatever it is. And yet God remains silent. And for this Eliphaz to say, receive, please, instruction from his mouth. <laughs> what do you think I've been crying out to God for this whole time? What do you think I've been pleading to him to do this? I've been begging him. I've been crying until there's no more tears in my tear ducts. God, show me, instruct me, reveal to me. Don't remain silent. We're going to see it again, by the way. That is the anguish of his soul. He longs, he aches to hear a word from his God whom he loves so much. And I assure you that were God to speak even one word, oh, that would be it. That's all he wants. And then Eliphaz says, and lay up his words in your heart. <laughs> to me, that is the ultimate. Lay up his words in my heart, Eliphaz. Yeah. Receive instruction from his mouth, Eliphaz. Yeah. Verse 23. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If I return to the Almighty, Eliphaz, what do you think I've been trying to do here? I, I will do anything. But re return to him. I never left him. It, it seems like he's left me. I've never turned against him. It seems like God has turned against me. He said as much. And then Eliphaz continues, you will remove iniquity far from your tents. I don't have any iniquity in my tents. I've been trying to tell you that for the last 20 chapters. Well, almost 20 chapters. What iniquity? I'm telling you what iniquity. You tell me what iniquity. I will get rid of it in a New York second. New York second, by the way, is a very fast <laughs> measurement of time. I've been there. It's very fast, a New York second. I think it's actually the idiom is a New York minute, but I, it's more like a second. And he would have. Verse 24, then you will lay your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. Uh, joke care less about that. For then, verse 26, you will have your delight in the Almighty. He cares about that. And lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him. He will hear you and you will pay your vows. Pretty sure he always did that. You will, verse 28, also declare a thing and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways when they cast you down and you say exaltation will come. Then he will save the humble person. <laughs> He will even deliver one who is not innocent. Yes, he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. You see riddled throughout all of this, just accusation after accusation. I mean, you can count them. Uh, Job is proud, not humble. Uh, Job has impurity, not purity. Job is guilty, not innocent. And I mean, the list just goes on and on. And by the way, I, how would that have hurt when he says, 
so light will shine on your ways. Oh, I remember those days before all of this happened when light would shine on my ways. You'll pay your vows. I remember we even have a record of it, the beginning of the book in chapter one, how that he would always pay his vows. And even he would make sacrifices for his children even because he didn't know if they had sinned. And this is pre-law. This is pre-Mosaic law, law of Moses. This is pre-priesthood. This is pre-everything. And he's doing that which would yet future be instituted in the history of Israel. Well, this is, and by the way, <laughs> if I could just encourage you at this juncture in the Bible study, uh, this is the last time this guy speaks. <laughs> Not a moment too soon. However, before we celebrate, we need to address his last words, which are troublesome to say the least. Think this through with me. He not only attacks Job's character, which when you attack somebody's character, that is the lowest of lows. When you stoop to that level and you attack somebody's character falsely no less, that is the lowest of lows. But he actually, and I don't know if you caught it or not, he actually has the audacity to insinuate that Job is of no value to God. In other words, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't value you. Can you imagine all that he's been through and then to have to listen to someone like this say something like that? Adam Clark of this wrote, Thus ends Eliphaz the Temanite, who began with a tissue of the bitterest charges, continued with the most cruel insinuations, and ended with commonplace exhortations to repentance and promises of secular blessings in consequence. I mean, this is textbook. You do this, God will do that. Tit for tat. Insert tab A, slot B, you get C. That's our theology. G. Camel Morgan had an interesting comment. He writes, great and wonderful words are these. What? <laughs> Wait, are we reading the same chapter here? Yeah. Great and wonderful words are these had Eliphaz applied them to himself. <laughs> he would have found that his own imperfect acquaintance with God, remember the, the accusation, the insinuation, you need to get acquainted with God. Oh, me? What about you? He would have found that his own imperfect acquaintance with God was the reason why he was not able to bring any real comfort to his suffering friend. And herein lies what I referred to earlier. Would you agree with me that they have no interest in comforting or ministering to Job. You know what their, their sole goal, if I can say it that way, is? Their sole goal is not to comfort Job, is to confront Job in their piety, in their pride, in their arrogance. This is a classic case of being a police instead of a paramedic. No offense, Artie. I love you. Sergeant Artie Kendall. <laughs> sir. But the policeman 
when there's been an accident, arrives on the scene and his only concern, right, is who broke the law? Who's in the wrong? Who ran the red light? That's what the police is there to do. Now, arriving on the scene also are the paramedics. They're not there. That's Artie's job. They're not there to find out who's in the wrong, who broke the law, who's, who, who ran the red light, causing the accident. Their only concern is to minister to the injured and wounded. They're not paramedics. <laughs> That's not why they're there. They're there to police him, not to minister to him. They could care less that this man is hanging on by a thread. This man is at the end. And how much more can he take? The Lord knows. The Lord knows how much more he can bear up under. But their only concern is to police him. This is, this is quintessential legalism. And you'll forgive the bluntness with which I say this, and, but those of you who, who know me, you're, 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 you're used to it. <laughs> but when it comes to the legalist, man, I'll tell you, the, the, the legalist is only concerned about the law. You've, you've transgressed the law. You've, you've broken the law. You are guilty. You are guilty. And, and by the way, uh, we're going to, I can't wait, Ephesians 4, Sunday morning, Lord willing, we turn a corner. The, the book of Ephesians is fabulous because the first three chapters are all about what God has done for us. And the last three chapters are all about our response because of what God has done for us. And therein lies the key to living a victorious Christian life. It, it changes everything. And it, it's, it has nothing to do with us trying to be pleasing and acceptable and living lives that are pleasing in the sight of the Lord. When I, I don't want to preach Sunday morning's service. This is a little bit of a teacher. This is all I'm going to say. <laughs> Maybe. But when I fully embrace all that God has done for me, my response to Him comes as a result of knowing what God's done for me. When, when I consider how much He's forgiven me of, and, and I, I won't, I'll withhold forgiveness from others, when I consider how gracious he's been to me, and I'm going to not be gracious to others. When I consider how much he loves me, and I'm not going to be loving towards others. And it's so interesting because uh, he talks very practically, nuts and bolts practically, about husbands and wives and marriages, employers and employees. And it's all in the spiritual warfare. And it all hinges on the first three chapters of all that God has done for us. Exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could have ever imagined or thought of, let alone asked. And that changes a man. You know, when you go through hardship and you're on the receiving end of God's amazing grace, it gives you a compassion for people. When, when you've been broken and crushed, and you've gone through unspeakable tragedy and pain and difficulty. It gives you a softness and a compassion towards other people, especially when they're going through something similar to what you've gone through. You just, you genuinely care about them and you genuinely want to minister to them. And that's not what we have here. The harshest people you'll find are those who are the legalists. They're the Eliphazes. They're these guys. They're the police. They're not the paramedics. They're only there to point out the wrong. And, and they're hypercritical. 
These are the kind of people that, and again, I'm just going to refer to the mainland. They're the kind of people that will come into a church, and I've met a few of them. <laughs> and they have nothing good to say. Everything, they're so critical. They have an opinion, so opinionated. Well, the worship wasn't, which I always like. I, I love that one. You know why I love that one? Because my response, <laughs> it's a sanctified strength. I realize it. But I just say, you know what? Uh, the worship isn't for you. The worship is for the Lord. We're not here to entertain you. Well, then, of course, you know, I've been on the receiving end of my fair share of criticisms as the pastor. Well, you're I say, well, you know what? <laughs> you need to go to a church where you can be supportive of the pastor and you can become part of a body of believers. We're obviously not the right church for you. You know what really scares me is, I might be <laughs> a little bit too candid here, but what really scares me when somebody says, hey, you know, new to the church, we're sh church shopping. <gasps> you're shopping for a church? Like you're shopping for furniture? I, <laughs> that's, that's what I call Christian consumerism. These, these are consumers. It's, they're only there for what the church can do for them. And you can tell by the body language, just sit there like this. Okay. Bless me. <laughs> you know, the worship better be good. The sermon better be short and it better be relevant. And then we're looking at their watch. Oh. I, I was listening to uh, Jim Cymbal of Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, and he made a very interesting comment. He says, what is it about Christians that if the pastor goes over, starts, you know, you know, the, 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 the service is a little bit longer, and they're like, look at their watches, and wow, what, what, they got other things to do? Oh, it, if, if a game goes into overtime, no complaints. No complaints. How about a two-hour movie? No problem. But boy, if the pastor goes too long. Oh. And then he says this, and, I, and, and it really makes sense to me. And I'll tell you, it, he says, um, why would God let people into heaven who don't want to be there? Isn't this what we're going to be doing for all eternity? What are we going to be? What, why, why, it, where else what do you want to be? Well, I got things to do. You got things to do. Wait, you, you don't want to be in church? In the presence of the Lord? Worshiping the Lord with God's people? You'd rather be someplace else? You're not going to really enjoy heaven much, are you? All right. Okay, I'm, I'm done ranting and raving. <laughs> Let's get back to our Bible study already in progress. We'll see how much further we can get. Don't look at your watches. How could you after I just said that, right? <laughs> you see what I'm doing here? That was pretty good, wasn't it? Kind of, we might go a little bit longer tonight. Not necessarily. Verse 1, Job 23. <laughs> Job's going to answer Eliphaz. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. Ah! I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright could reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Look, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. This does not sound like a guy that Eliphaz was uh, describing, does it? 
Eliphaz was describing a guy that's running from God in his wickedness before God. This sounds like the polar opposite. This sounds like a guy that's just crying out to God, don't hide your face from me. I, I just, I long to see you. I go to the right, I can't find you. I go to the left, you're not there. I go forward, you're not there either. I go backward, I cannot perceive you. Where are you, God? Verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Ah, he, he, <laughs> he's right. And it's going to happen exactly as he said. Verse 11, my foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside as you have accused me of. Eliphaz, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips, verse 12, as you have accused me of, Eliphaz. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But he is unique. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me, because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, and he did not hide deep darkness from my face. I want you to kind of bear with me. And, and hear me out on this because this is very important. It is so vital that we understand this about Job. Now, think this through with me. We've, we've again talked about this prior. I think we would do well to revisit this again. We have a glimpse here into the heart of this righteous man. And this righteous man wants nothing more than to restore his relationship with his God. That's all he cares about. Uh, he Notice, he never once has asked for a physical healing, right? Am I right? For those of you who have been with us from the beginning of this study through the book of Job, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, have you one time do you one time remember Job asking for a physical healing? No. Have you ever once heard him in his prayer crying out to God, give me my children back from the grave? Not one time. Not one time. The sole desire of Job's soul, sorry for the play on words, the sole desire of his soul is for his relationship with God to be restored. That's all he cares about. He lost everything but wants God more than anything. Let me say the same thing in a different way. Job cares nothing about anything but God. That's all he wants. He's longing for, even aching for, just one word from his God, who he once had such intimacy with. Yet God is silent. He hears nothing. The only thing he hears are these false accusations from these miserable comforters, as he calls them. And that's being kind. Miserable comforters. I, I, the miserable word's okay. I have an other word in mind. I will not repeat it from this pulpit. Charles Spurgeon said this. In Job's uttermost extremity, he cried after the Lord. The longing desire of an afflicted child of God is once more to see his father's face. His first prayer is not, oh, that I might be healed of the disease which now festers in every part of my body. 
nor even, oh, that I might see my children restored from the jaws of the grave and my property once more brought from the hand of the spoiler. But the first and uppermost cry is, oh, that I knew where I might find him. Who is my God that I might come even to his seat? Even if I could just see him one more time. Feel the warmth of his embrace just one more time. That's all I want. I want nothing more. Chapter 24. Since times are not hidden from the Almighty, why do those who know him see not his days? Some remove landmarks. They seize flocks violently and feed on them. They drive away the donkey of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox as a pledge. They Notice, he doesn't say we. <laughs> I've never done that. They've done that. You've accused me of doing this. I've never done this. They, verse 4, push the needy off the road. All the poor of the land are forced to hide. Indeed, like wild donkeys in the desert, they go out to their work searching for food. The wilderness yields food for them and for their children. They gather their fodder in the field and glean in the vineyard of the wicked. They spend the night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and huddle around the rock for want of shelter. Some snatch the fatherless from the breast and take a pledge from the poor. They cause the poor to go naked without clothing and they take away the sheaves from the hungry. They press out oil within their walls and tread wine presses yet suffer thirst. The dying groan in the city and the souls of the wounded cry out, yet God does not charge them with wrong. Remember when we talked about Oswald Chambers quoted as saying that God never faults a man for despair. In all of this, God does not charge them with wrong. There are those who rebel against the light. Now he's not talking about those who have perpetrated this against these victims. But here he is. There are those who rebel against the light. They do not know its ways nor abide in its paths. The murderer rise with the light, rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy. And in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark they break into houses, which they mark for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light. 4 verse 17, the morning is the same to them as the shadow of death. If someone recognizes them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. In other words, they wait for uh, the morning light and they, they want to escape lest somebody should notice them in the daylight. They, verse 18, should be swift on the face of the waters. Their portion should be cursed in the earth so that no one would turn into the way of their vineyards as drought and heat consume the snow waters. So the grave consumes those who have sinned. The womb should forget them. The worm should feed sweetly on him. He should be remembered no more and wickedness should be broken like a tree. For he preys on the barren who do not bear and does no good for the widow. But God draws the mighty away with his power. He rises up, but no man is sure of life. He gives them security and they rely on it. Yet his eyes are on their ways. They are exalted for a little while, then they are gone. They are brought low. They are taken out of the way like all others. They dry out like the heads of grain. Now, if it is not so, who will prove me a liar and make my speech worth nothing? You know what? I, I, I hate this because I found myself already just in reading through the chapter, rushing through it. And I don't want to rush through this. Okay? So we're not going <laughs> to... Make it to chapter 25. By the way, chapter 25, I think, is only like six verses. But uh, I want to pick it up, Lord willing, next week in uh, chapter 24. And I'll leave you with this because, and this is why I don't want to uh, rush through this. This is too important. Uh, and it deals with why it is that it seems that the wicked are allowed to prosper. And I think this is apropos for our day today. It seems that evil goes unpunished. 
And Job is asking in this chapter, and this is why I want to spend some time, Lord willing, next week where we'll pick it up here. Uh, Job is asking a question that I think a lot of us are asking today. And that question is, why does God seemingly delay in bringing about a just and righteous judgment on those who do evil? Um, I'm going to give you some homework. Is that okay? <laughs> kind of reminds you of when you were back in school, right? My son Levi was going to uh, come to church tonight, and he said, Baba, I've got so much homework. And so I said, okay, I forgive you. You're still saved. You can do your homework. So I'm going to give you some homework uh, for next week. I want you to spend some time in Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Psalm 73. It actually answers this question for us. And it's the answer to the question that Job is asking here. And it really comports, for lack of a better word, with the whole dilemma that we see here with Job. And really it speaks to this whole dynamic of how it is and why it is that it just seems like in a world that is waxing more and more evil by the day, they just get away with it. And it gets worse and worse and nothing happens. And God doesn't judge them. And we want God to judge them. Why does God delay? Why does God delay the judgment on those who do evil. So Psalm 73, Lord willing, next week we'll um, pick it up here and then um, we'll just do a recap on chapter 24. Chapter 25, yeah, it is only six verses. <laughs> and oh, let me just give you some hope. Let me end on a really good note here. This will really encourage your heart. I just got to make sure I'm, I'm uh, on the right page here. Yes, the end of chapter 25 has Bildad's final words, so long, but it's also the end of all three of these guys. They no longer, after chapter 25, speak. we're not out of the woods yet, but after chapter 25, we are, we are done with these guys. They, they speak no more. <laughs> And thank God, chapter 25 is only six verses in length when Bildad says uh, his last words. <clears throat> Why don't you stand? <coughs> Pardon me, we'll pray. <coughs> Got a little excited there. <coughs> Pardon me. Father in heaven, I, oh, this is gnarly, certainly. But oh, how needed is this? So much from this that we can take with us tonight. And as we do, Lord, we can look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, the author and the perfecter of our faith. As you're always so faithful to, by the Holy Spirit, begin that process of applying this to our lives, the many truths that are here for us. Lord, I pray that we would be teachable, that we would receive, even as convicting as it might be, the truth, even as wounding as it might be. Lord, search our hearts. See if there be anything at all that keeps us from loving you, knowing you, and hearing you. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.